one. I understand that St. Robert's they've been doing some kind of a series on St. Joseph, you know, to celebrate his month, his time. And our topic today is, you know, the saints among us. And the saints are going to, because there's been a little Joseph theme, I'll start off with one that you have heard of, and that's Joseph, and then we'll be, move to our ordinary peasants like ourselves. We get to meet Joseph through Matthew's Gospel. You know, the Christmas time stuff. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. That's his introduction. And that's our introduction to St. Joseph. His name is quickly mentioned four times in a very few verses. And yet the truth is, we know very little, or let's say we know nothing about him. Nevertheless, even from the few meager hints that we have, it would appear that three things do stand out about this man from Nazareth. He was perplexed, he was marginal, and he was a loser. He was perplexed. Why not? His fiance was pregnant by another man as far as he could figure out. So he was torn between his trust in her and what seemed like the obvious facts. He was afraid to take her as his wife, a fear that was noted by the angel Gabriel, do not be afraid, Joseph. So between his knowledge of Mary's condition and that dream of his, he spent tortured days and sleepless nights. There was just so much he didn't understand. That's how we first meet this man. Secondly, he was marginal. I mean, he comes and he goes so quickly in the gospel story. He's gone and he's forgotten. Did you ever notice there is not one recorded word from Joseph in the entire Bible? Everyone else has things to say, a lot of things. The angel, Mary, the talkative shepherds, Herod, the Magi. But not Joseph, silence. The spotlight literally and figuratively shines on Mary and Jesus. He's not even the child's real father. He's a stepdad. The major scenes that we see in the great Renaissance paintings often put Joseph in the shadows. You can barely make him out. Like the old Lone Ranger series, everybody asks, who is that masked man? We really don't know. Finally, to put it mildly, he was a loser. He had to fall in love with a mystic, someone claimed by a higher power. He had to struggle with doubts and desperately search for answers. He lost his wife to God, as it were. Then he, the so-called great family man today, lost his teenage son, and he had to go through the streets of Jerusalem, up and down the alleyways, looking for him. And finally, somewhere between that search for Jesus and the start of Jesus' public ministry, he lost his life. He was gone, deceased. He left his wife a widow, and his son followed us. What a great track record. So Joseph the marginal, Joseph the perplexed, and Joseph the loser. And yet in our times, laced with fears and depression and terrors of endless wars, the pandemic, the divided nation, it is Joseph, I suggest, who speaks to many and resonates with many and identifies with many, with us. Let's look. We said that Joseph was perplexed. And God knows we are perplexed. There's so much we don't understand in today's world. Why so much suffering? 
Why the murder and mayhem rate appallingly high? Every day there's new figures. We never had anything like this in our country. Why do families break up? Why do children kill children? Why do parents divorce? Why are so many on drugs? Why are so many young people who should have the world in their hand are committing suicide? Why, in short, is there so much evil? We are perplexed. But notice that Joseph, also the perplexed, just didn't stand there paralyzed. His perplexity did not stop him from doing what he could. Quietly, he left his, led his pregnant wife on a long caravan journey to Bethlehem. He found a place for her to have a baby. He fled with his family to Egypt like the trapped family fleeing the Nazis and supported them there with his handiwork, taught his son a trade, and all quietly in the background. You see, the point is, in spite of so much that he didn't understand, out of the spotlight, he just did what he could to make this world a better place in his part of the world. He did his duty, simply, faithfully, loyally, dependently. And so to that extent, I think Joseph speaks to us all who are perplexed, and he says in the fact, do what you can do to be caring and compassionate and helpful. Stay loyal and faithful to your beliefs and your convictions. Do your duty where you are. You make this place a better world. He said he was marginal, but the man had dreams to sustain him. The angel appeared to him, and he had a dream. And that the dream, as I said, upheld him, just like another marginal person of our century who proclaimed, I have a dream. And therefore, he also speaks to today's hopeless and today's marginal. I mean, not those who are shunted because of the color of their skin or the nationality that they have, but the slow, the unpopular, the unattractive, the disappointed, the poor, the hurting, those considered on the fringe of Nerdville, beyond the social pale, anyone who desperately dreams that things could be better. And Joseph the dreamer speaks to them all. He reminds them to hold on and cherish their dreams. Have faith, he would say. Look, as it turned out, Mary of Nazareth became the queen of heaven. Jesus, the infant in danger of murderous death, became savior. And he himself, dreamer that he was, eventually emerged from the shadows over the centuries so that the whole world today knows him as Saint Joseph. So we have faith in God. Remember Joseph, cherish your dreams. Finally, he said, we said he, he was a loser. He's a man who knew loss. And therefore he speaks to everyone else who are losers, who have suffered the loss, the loss of health, the loss of memory, getting there, loss of spouses, loss of friends, loss of trust, in our nation, in our institutions. So there are empty souls and empty hearts and empty places at many a table in our country. It's so unbearably sad. And Joseph, who almost lost a wife and did at one time lose a son, he knows that feeling. But again, he also knew that God would have the last word. God in time would make loss flower into compassion and service and growth. And although the scars would remain and grief would now and then openly assert itself, loss would be the seeding place of quiet greatness. And so if, and we are, if we are like Joseph, perplexed, marginalized, hurting, let his steadfastness 
an example be ours. Stand with him as you utter this ancient Gallic prayer, a true Joseph kind of prayer. As the rain hides the stars, as the autumn mist hides the hills, as the clouds veil the blue of the sky, so the dark happenings of my life hide the shining, shining of thy face from me. Yet, if I may hold thy hand in the darkness, it is enough. Even though I may, I may stumble in my going, thou dost not fall, thou dost not. to people we never heard of before. A little short vignettes here. I want to introduce you to Barney Casey. See if you never heard of him. He was born in 1870 in Wisconsin. Came from one of those large immigrant failings of families at the time. We can't even imagine today. He was the sixth out of 16 children. Ten boys and six girls. He was a fairly nondescript, nerdy kind of a kid, but a kind of mainstay of his family who worked the family farm. Early on, he had contracted diphtheria, which damaged his voice, leaving it somewhat wispy. Uh, he eventually moved on to find work where he could as a lumberjack, and then he was a brick maker and a prison guard. Finally, he wound up being a streetcar conductor. And as a streetcar conductor, one day he witnessed a tragedy that changed his life, set him on a new course. And here's the way it happened. On a cold, rainy afternoon, as he guided his streetcar around the curve through a rough part of town, he saw a crowd of people gathered on the tracks. He stopped the car, pushed through the crowd to see a young, drunken sailor standing over a woman that he had assaulted and stabbed repeatedly. Later, he couldn't get the incident out of his mind. He prayed for the sailor. He prayed for the woman. And gradually, he began to feel he should pray for the whole world. So, at 21, he quit his job, and he applied to St. Francis Seminary in Milwaukee. Five years later, Barney applied to and joined the Caption Order at St. Bonaventure's in Detroit, where he got his religious name of Solanus, after St. Francis Solanus, Solanus Casey now. But Barney was not that bright, or at least that appeared so, because the classes he were taught were in German, which he didn't know. In any case, when it came time for him to approach a possible ordination, his professors opposed it. He just didn't have it. But an old priest spoke up for him. And finally, Barney was ordained in 1904 at 33. However, doubts lingered about his ability and about his intelligence. And so the only thing they would permit him to do under, in, at his ordination time was that he would remain what is called a simplex priest. That is, he could celebrate mass, period. He could not hear confessions. He could not preach. He could not wear the capuchin hood. Still, although he could not preach an official sermon, he could and he did give little conferences. He gave inspirational talks here and there. And they wound up inspiring and captivating many people. And so time marches on. And for 43 years, Father Sabatus Casey never heard a confession, never gave a retreat, never preached a mission. So what did he do? Officially, he was assigned a sacristan and the doorkeeper. He answered the door to, you know, welcome visitors, a no-brainer. 
He spent his first 15 years entering the door in Yonkers and in Manhattan, and then in 1921, he was transferred to Our Lady of Angels in Harlem, if any of you know that. But in this desert of the ordinary, the Word of God bypassed the bishop, and bypassed the chantry officials, and bypassed the abbot, and he came to Barney. Because the ordinary people were discovering something about this doorkeeper. And it was this. This simple doorkeeper, having listened so intently to the word of God, turned out to be a wonderful listener himself and a very insightful counselor. He had that kind of a demeanor, that kind of spiritual simplicity that invited people to open up their hearts to him. He became known for his great compassion and insight. Word spread, and soon many, many would come and they would bypass the prior and the abbot and ask to speak to the doorkeeper, Father Barney Salalis. But that wasn't all. Father Salalis was put in charge of the Tapishan Prayer Association, but no sooner did he take charge than miracles began to appear. People were being healed of all kinds of ailments, pneumonia, heart disease, blindness. The doorkeeper turned out to be a wonder worker. And his supporters soon transferred him back to St. Father Andrews of Detroit, where they could keep an eye on him and a lid on him. He was getting too well known. But he attracted their an even larger following. And so for the next two decades, people trekked literally from all over the world, like the crowds that came to John the Baptist in the desert, to receive the simple doorkeeper's ministry and to listen to his words. Father Salanus, Barney Kaser, Casey, you know, the streetcar driver, worked 12 hours a day helping and counseling others. At night he was found praying in the chapel and often sound asleep before the altar. He became ill in his old age and his last conscious act was to sit up in bed saying, I give my soul to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so the streetcar driver turned simple priest, not trusted with anything important. He died at the age of 86 in 1957, the same hour and the same day as his first mass 57 years earlier. Some 20,000 people passed his coffin. His cause, by the way, is now up for canonization. He's been declared venerable. I mean, who would have thought in the car capital of the world, God would come to somebody who answers the door and let his light out? Everything About two generations ago in Idaho, a small boy, rather delicate, not too well dressed to say it nicely, was looking wistfully at some freshly packed green beans at Jim Miller's corner grocery store. Hello, Barry, Mr. Miller said. How are you today? Oh, hi, Mr. Miller. Fine, thanks. Uh, I was just uh, admiring those uh, the, the peas there. They sure look good. Oh, they are good, Barry. How's your ma? Fine. Getting stronger all the time. Good. Anything I can help you with? Uh, no, sir, he said. Just admiring those peas. Would you like to take some home? Asked Mr. Miller. Uh, no, sir. I got nothing to pay them for. Well, what have you got to trade me for some of those peas? All I got, he says, is my prize marble here. Is that right, Mr. Miller said? Let's see it. Here it is, it's a dandy. Hmm, I can see that. The only thing one is that this one's blue, and I kind of go for red. Do you have a red one like this at home? Not exactly, said Barry, but almost. Tell you what, said Mr. Miller. Take this sack of peas home with you, and the next trip this way, you let me look at that red marble. I sure will, thanks, Mr. Miller. Well, it turns out, 
that this was an oft-repeated scenario for Jim Miller. The fact was that there were two other boys like Barry, all very poor, and Mr. Miller would always bargain with them for peas or apples or tomatoes or whatever, and when they came back with their red marbles, as they always did, Mr. Miller invariably seemed to decide somehow that he doesn't like red after all and sends them home with the produce in exchange for a green or orange marble when they would make their next trip. And this trade-off was repeated countless times. Okay, fast forward. The years go by, the boys grow up. Old Mr. Miller dies. The folk all come to his home, where, as was the custom in the old days, Mr. Miller is laid out. Among the many visitors are three young men, one in the army uniform, the other with nice haircuts and business suits. They take their turn among the crowd and they approach Mrs. Miller, each hugging her and kissing her on the cheek. They speak briefly to her and then they move on to the casket. And each young man pauses by the casket, places his own warm hand over Jim's cold one, and leaves awkwardly wiping his eyes. The evening wears on, the hour's late. After most of the people have left, Mrs. Miller goes over to the casket, looks at her beloved husband, pauses a while, and then smiles and lifts up his lifeless fingers. She already knows what she will find. Three exquisitely shined red marbles. Everyday Saints. Some of you may know the name of Alan Payton, the famous uh, African writer, Cry to Beloved Countries, his famous book. He stole the story about Robert Mainsfield. Now, Mainsfield was a white man in South Africa, and he was headmaster of a white school who took his athletic teams to play cricket and hockey against the black schools. That is, until the Department of Education forbade him to do it anymore. So, he resigned in protest. Now, shortly after that, a man named Emmanuel Nene, a leader in the black community, came to meet him. He said, I've come to see a man who resigns his job because he doesn't wish to obey an order that will prevent children from playing with each other. He replies, Mansfield replied, I resign because I think it's time to go out and fight everything that separates people from one another. Do I look like a knight in shining armor? Ah, oh, yes, you look like a knight in shining armor, but you're going to get wounded, do you know that? And if they reply, I expect they may happen. Well, then they said, you expect correctly. People don't like what you're doing, but I'm thinking of joining with you in the battle. You're going to wear shining armor too? Mainsfield asked. Yes, and I'm going to get wounded too. Not only by the government, but also by my own people as well. Aren't you worried about the wounds? I don't worry about the wounds, then they said. When I get there, which is my intention, the big judge will say to me, where are your wounds? And if I say I haven't any, he will say, wasn't there nothing to fight for? Oh, I couldn't face that question. Every day to say to leaves us with that question. Is there anything worth fighting for? Or as the gospel would express it, is there nothing in our Christian lives worth being hated for? Such are the little people, and such are the saints among us.